In a conversation with a social justice warrior, I was directed to an article by John Greenberg on EverydayFeminism.com. Ten examples that prove white privilege protects white people in every aspect imaginable. It's a good thing that title isn't hyperbolic or anything, because then I would need to provide more than one counterexample to debunk it. I'm a nice guy, though, so I'll give this incendiary piece of political correctness more time than it deserves. Let's go through their list. 1. I have the privilege of, generally, having a positive relationship with the polies. Whoops. I'm going to have to stop you right there. Even I thought we'd get further than their first claim, but no. Now, my skin is pretty white, but my arrest record is also pretty extensive. I'm not quite sure how to articulate how I feel about this claim. If I were human, I believe my response would be, go to hell. If I were human. Ah, yes. Thank you, Captain Spock. That's it exactly. I believe what the confused author was thinking of was female privilege. It's female privilege that all but guarantees a positive relationship with the police. It's female privilege that ensures the police are there to protect and not bully you. Where is Everyday Feminism's article acknowledging this? During one of my arrests, I had the pleasant experience of being tased by the jolly policeman. I can assure you that at that time I wasn't thinking, Oh, thank goodness for my white privilege. It generally provides me with a positive relationship with police. Nope. Nope, that wasn't it. Feminism has a PR problem. I do acknowledge that had I been black, the probability of me being shot would likely have been greater. As it was, while they were on top of me cuffing me, they only joked with each other about having nearly pulled the real gun instead. A better PR strategy would be to speak of black disadvantage rather than white privilege. It would firstly be more accurate, as any talk of white privilege tends to ignore Asian privilege or Jewish privilege, both of which are more significant. Let's not forget about those pesky Jews. They're the original Asians. They've been outperforming and out-earning other European whites for a thousand years, and they've been hated for it. I think even feminism is smart enough not to speak of Jewish privilege, though. Sure, it's both logical and necessary to discuss Jewish privilege alongside the rest of their present rhetoric, but it would instantly expose third-wave feminism as the dangerous hate movement that it is. All you have to do is put those two words together, and the average feminist sympathizer would instantly get it. Now I see what those angry anti-feminists were seeing all along. It's a bad idea to blame an entire group of people for being disproportionately successful, because that's exactly what happened to the Jews and the Kulaks. I'll clarify, just in case, that I don't think a feminist genocide is too likely. But blaming one or another ethnic group, or gender, for the problems of society is ugly even when it doesn't lead there. Anyway, where was I? Black disadvantage. Second of all, it feels a lot less like someone is wagging the finger of blame in your face. Now I know feminism doesn't care how white people feel, but it should care about how well it's selling its message. Right now, not so well. Okay, that didn't take too long. On to claim two of ten. I have the privilege of being favored by school authorities. No, you're, you're thinking of female privilege again. It's the girls who have the higher graduation rate. It's the girls who are coddled by a system that discourages competition and rewards long attention span. It's the girls who are far less likely to receive disciplinary action. It's the girls who are far less likely to be forced onto prescription drugs to cure their normal healthy behavior. And it is, of course, the girls who have the advantage of being the same gender as the majority of their teachers and often being favored therefore. Back to race, though. This section of the article starts with Ahmed Muhammad, implying his ordeal was the result of his lack of white privilege. What it actually reflects is the ridiculousness of zero-tolerance policies. Whether in schools or in laws, the trend is clear. Understanding and forgiveness for low-level offenses makes for a much happier and better adjusted society. Would Ahmed have been arrested if he were white? 
And if he weren't named Ahmed, let's ask Josh Welch. Hi, Josh. Do you think white privilege provides any kind of special protection against the absurdities of zero tolerance policies in schools? Nope. Okay, thank you for your time. There is further reason to believe Ahmed planned to do what he did. For some reason, he wanted to get arrested. I can't quite put my finger on it. But there must have been some motivation behind his actions. Maybe, just maybe, he and his family knew PC liberals are easy to manipulate. Next, and you're going to have a hard time believing this is real life once I say it, this feminist article on this feminist website cites a case of a black boy being suspended for staring at a white girl. Are you kidding me? Tell me you are kidding me. They're actually calling this racism. If your head didn't just explode, let me fill you in. Criminalizing men's use of their eyeballs isn't racism. It's feminism. This is exactly what feminism has been fighting for. Here is a reenactment of the incident. Hey. Be careful. You've been staring at her for 10 seconds. What? It's a form of harassment to stare at a woman for more than 15 seconds straight. And when I use the term straight, I don't mean to offend any persons of a non-traditional sexual preference. And when I use the term non-traditional, I don't mean to offend any persons who oppose historically normalized... Okay, okay, I get it. You can't wage war on white men without having non-white casualties. It's just like the first man-spreading arrests in New York. It was two Latino men. I don't envy the poor feminist, struggling to find consistency in her ideological worldview. They must be so torn when this kind of thing happens. This is going long, so I'll just do one more for now. I have the privilege of attending segregated schools of affluence. Ah, now they're getting closer. We have a serious race problem in American schools. I graduated from a high school that was roughly 10% black. I later taught at a high school that was 99.9% .9 black, and that I saw only one white kid there. The problem is that these two schools were a whopping two miles apart. What gives? Why must races cluster like they do? Forget progress. At this point, I want to desegregate American schools for OCD reasons alone. It bugs me. Homogeneity in schools or communities in general isn't a healthy thing. The South gets a lot of hate for being backwards, but urban communities in the North are just as isolated and backward as rural communities in the South. Sorry if it's not PC of me to say so. Homogeneous communities don't get the influx of new ideas they need. I honestly don't think most of these kids had ever seen an atheist before. At least not one who was open about it. Our principal got at least one call from a parent complaining about the teacher who wears all black and doesn't believe in God. I've never been so amused or pleased with myself for being called to the principal's office. I didn't attend a segregated school. The kids on the other side of the tracks did, and they were culturally poorer for it. Change segregated to desegregated, and I pretty much agree with this one. I would, however, still claim this is a middle-class privilege, not a white privilege. I hate to end part one on a sympathetic note, but don't worry, the next seven claims get a lot crazier and a lot dumber.